Hello and welcome to this online presentation on head injuries hosted by Paramedical Services. The contents of this presentation will include an introduction and some epidemiology regarding head injuries and traumatic brain injuries, a review of the anatomy and physiology of the head and the brain, then we'll discuss the different types of skull fractures, the different types of traumatic brain injuries, how to assess them in the pre-hospital setting, and how to provide the pre-hospital management for these conditions. Traumatic brain injuries account for more than 100,000 varying degrees of disability every year. Uh, head injuries account for approximately half of all traumatic deaths, and second to that is chest and thoracic injuries. In Australia, there are approximately 19 million people with an acquired brain injury living today. On analysing the causes of these different injuries, 23% were attributed to motor vehicle accidents. 23% of the injuries were as a result of unprotected road user accidents, such as motorcyclists, cyclists or pedestrians. 10% was a result of low falls, and this is under a metre high. 18% was a result from what was considered high falls from above one meter. 9% was attributed to assault. 9% were water related activities and sports. And 8% were attributed to other causes such as recreational activities or an unknown etiology. 20% of all survivors of traumatic brain injuries have permanent neurological deficit and as you can imagine this puts a tremendous amount of strain on the person, their families and on the government paying for the recovery of these patients and the lifelong care. In 2008 the estimated costs of traumatic brain injuries in Australia was approximately $8.6 billion. Uh, I'm sure that's increased quite dramatically over the years, which as you can see puts a tremendous amount of financial pressure on the system and spending in the healthcare department. Populations that were identified to be most at risk of having a traumatic brain injury or head injury were low income communities. Men were deemed more likely to sustain a head injury. Actually from all the statistics that were taken, approximately 84% of the patients who received a traumatic brain injury or had an acquired brain injury, 84% of those were male and only 16% were female and elderly due to the high incidence of falls. We're going to have a look at a little bit of the anatomy now. On the outermost layer of the skull and the head, we have the scalp, which is highly vascularized. It comprises of connective tissues and soft tissues, skin and hair. There's lots of blood vessels that feed the outside of the face and the outside of the head, supplying oxygen and nutrients to those tissues. Then beneath the scalp, we have the skull, which encloses the brain uh, within its cavity. And the skull bones and the facial bones are fused together. We'll discuss the different bones in the next few slides. Then beneath the bone layer, we have the meninges. The meninges are three different layers of connective tissues, which we'll also discuss in a bit more detail, that surround the brain and the spinal cord and contain the cerebral spinal fluid, which flows around the brain, through the brain, and around the spinal cord, keeping it protected from minor injuries. And then underneath that, we have the actual brain tissue, which again, we'll discuss in a bit more detail in the next few slides. Having a look first at the skull and facial bones, the head is comprised of 22 different bones all fused together. The facial bones consist of the mandible, which is the bottom jaw over here, the maxilla, the top jaw extending up towards the nasal bone and the zygomas or the cheekbones that we see over here. These are the different facial bones which are then fused and connected into the skull bones. The skull bones consist of the lacrimal bone, the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone. These bones over here all create the interior border of the skull and these then connect onto the frontal bone on the forehead over here, 
the parietal bones running down the back of the head and the side, the occipital bone at the posterior region of the head, and the temporal bones running along the side or lateral aspects of the head. These bones of the skull create an enclosed cavity. It's only got one major opening in and out of the skull and that's called the foramen magnum is where the spinal cord enters in through the skull and connects into the brain tissue. Despite this one major opening, there are a few smaller openings in the skull, but they are all filled with nerves and blood vessels. Now, because all of these openings are filled with tissue, the skull is still considered to be a enclosed cavity. And this encases and protects the very delicate gelatinous brain tissue from damage. Interestingly enough, these bones of the cranium are not actually fused together at the time of birth. All infants are born with these bones floating apart from one another. And at approximately nine months after birth, these bones start to grow and fuse together. And at about 18 months, all the bones of the cranium are fused together. Here we have a great picture which helps us to understand and to visualize that base of the skull which I was explaining in the previous slide. We'll start with going over the different bones just so you can orientate yourself and we'll end off with those base of the skull bones. Firstly at the inferior portion of the skull we have that opening in the skull that foramen magnum in which the spinal cord enters into the brain by. Then at the posterior portion of the head, we have the occipital bone. Moving on up, we come to the parietal bone. We usually have the temporal bone along the side or lateral aspects of the head over here. The frontal bone running down the front and this quite clearly depicts the different sinuses embedded in that frontal bone. Then continuing on, we have the bones which make up the base of the skull. These include the ethmoid bones over here and the sphenoid bones connecting again into that occipital bone. The bones making up the base of the skull and the temporal bone are the thinnest bones in the cranium. And because of this, when the head undergoes a major blunt force trauma, the energy of that trauma is transmitted through the bones of the skull and the cranium and usually then fracture at the weakest points. So fractures are very common in the temporal region as well as the base of the skull bones. Now having a look at the layers underneath the skull, these three connective tissue layers are called the meninges and they consist of the dura mater, the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. The dura mater is the outermost layer of the meninges and it consists of a very tough and fibrous connective tissue that is very inflexible. It's called the dura mater because the Latin name means the tough mother or hard mother. The next layer down is called the arachnoid mater and this is the middle layer of the meninges. The arachnoid mater has a layer underneath it called the arachnoid space or the subarachnoid space. This arachnoid space contains the cerebral spinal fluid which flows around the brain and down through the spinal cord so it's continuous with both. The term arachnoid comes from the spider web like structure of the fibers and blood vessels in the arachnoid space. And these blood vessels and cerebral spinal fluid feeds the outside of the brain and the spinal cord with oxygen and nutrients as well as eliminating waste products. Then the innermost layer of the meninges is called the pia mater and this layer adheres closely to the brain and the spinal cord forming a protective membrane. If you have a look at the diagram on the right hand side over here the turquoise color in the diagram represents the cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is a liquid which is produced within the ventricles of the brain. So this is just a exudate that comes out of the blood, just like your saliva or any other secretions in the body. It's just fluid that moves from the bloodstream 
into the space. This fluid, as we've mentioned already, circulates through the brain. So it goes from the ventricles around the arachnoid spaces around the brain and down the spinal cord. And because of the gelatinous texture and structure of the brain, it's very soft and pliable. This fluid helps to almost suspend the brain inside the cranium, as well as protecting the brain in an almost cushioning shock absorber fashion from small bumps and knocks. So altogether, the meninges with the cerebral spinal fluid mainly act as a protectant for the brain and the spinal cord, as well as delivering nutrients and removing waste products from those outer cells. We're now going to have a look at some of the structures and functions of the different brain tissues. The outer layer of the brain and the largest portion of the brain is called the cerebrum. The cerebrum is broken up into different lobes. They're named after the bones which they lie under. So the frontal lobe lays under the frontal bone, the parietal under the parietal bones, the occipital lobe under the occipital bone and the temporal under the temporal bone. The cerebrum is also divided into hemispheres down the middle and this is depicted on the right hand side of the picture. This is the cerebrum over here that structures the cerebellum. The cerebrum is divided into the left and right hand sides. The left side of the cerebrum controls functions on the right hand side of the body and the right side of the cerebrum controls functions on the left side of the body. That's why when we have a patient who's got a stroke on the right, they have manifestations physically on the left-hand side, such as paralysis or weakness or inability to move and lack of sensation. The left and the right hemispheres of the brain can also be attributed to being more inclined mathematically versus being more artistic or creatively inclined. Although this has some degree of truth, when viewing the brain and watching which neurons light up when somebody is doing a creative activity, it's not just one small portion of the brain where they have neurons lighting up. The whole brain is engaged because so many different functions are engaged in being creative. So even though they might say somebody is generally more left-brained or more right-brained. This is quite a vague description of the brain's function. The brain is so much more complex than we can even imagine, and it's one of the organs that we know least about in medicine. So the cerebrum is the place where we have the most complex thought, where we process language, we're able to engage in speech, sight, hearing, and emotions our artistic ability and creativity, our ability to reason, our memory, our ability to calculate and engage in mathematical problem solving and spatial awareness. There's many, many varying different capabilities that the cerebrum can conduct. These are just to name a few. Having a look at the brain through a cross section, we're able to see the other subsections of the brain and what they do. As we've mentioned on the outermost layer, there's that cerebrum. And the cerebrum is made up of what's called gray matter and white matter. The white matter is actually the nerve fibers, which extend anywhere from the spinal cord right up into the cerebrum. And the outer layers of the cerebrum is what's called our gray matter, where we have the actual nerve cell bodies. And we contain approximately 86 to 100 billion different nerves in the brain. And we have trillions of different synapses which connect these different nerves to one another to relay information to each part of the brain. Having a look further down from this cerebrum we have the diencephalon which is in the middle section over here which contains the thalamus and the hypothalamus as well as the pituitary gland this section of the brain is responsible for relaying messages to different parts of the cerebral cortex so there's a lot of nerves which cross over in that area it also regulates our consciousness our sleep patterns our level of alertness our body temperature and controlling other aspects such as when we want to eat or drink and also regulating our sexual drive. 
And this is where the nervous system also interconnects with the endocrine system in the pituitary gland over here. The pituitary gland is like the brain of the endocrine system. So messages are sent from the brain to the pituitary gland and that then releases the different chemicals necessary to stimulate other endocrine glands within the body. Then moving down from this section, we have at the back or the base of the brain over here that cerebellum, it's also called the tree of life or the arbor vitae. The cerebellum is what's responsible for our motor coordination. Most of our conscious and subconscious muscular movements are controlled by this area of the brain over here. It also helps us to be able to regulate and assess information that's coming from our eyes and ears to aid in balance as well as our posture and coordination. Then this inner section of the brain over here is called the brain stem and this is then concurrent with the spinal cord running through that foramen magnum over there. The brain stem consists of the midbrain, the pons and the medulla oblongata. This area is responsible for relaying nerve impulses from the cerebellum to the cerebrum for vital functioning of the body. This area helps to regulate digestion and aids also in temperature regulation through changes in the cardiovascular system. It also aids in sleep cycles, eye movements and reactions, equilibrium within the body, facial expression, and then the vital functions such as breathing and how fast or how slow our heart beats and the size of our blood vessel diameter. So this is where the respiratory and cardiovascular center of the body is housed. There are many, many more functions of the brain which I have not mentioned here. The complexity of the brain is enormous. And like I said, as scientists and physicians still do not fully comprehend what the brain is capable of and where exactly most functionings occur. The brain has a very extensive blood supply, uh, which 80% of comes from the carotid arteries. The common carotid artery running up the inside of the neck on both sides of the trachea branches into the external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is, is the branch that feeds the brain with its blood supply. About 80% of the brain's blood supply is supplied by the internal carotid arteries and about 20% of the brain's blood supply is supplied by the vertebral artery supplying blood to the spinal cord and the rear portions of the brain. These two artery systems are joined together by a connecting artery. So in the event of there being any injury to either the internal carotid or the vertebral artery, hopefully the other artery will still be intact and they'll be able to aid in circulation to the other portions of the brain. These connecting arteries create a circulation system in the brain, which is called the circle of Willis. The face, however, is mainly vascularized by the external carotid artery, which is a large branch of the common carotid artery. The face and the scalp are highly vascularized, and this often leads to the excessive bleeding that we see if somebody does have any facial or scalp trauma. Having a look now at the physiology of cerebral blood flow and how this is regulated, we need to first understand that the skull is a closed vault. In this closed vault, we have a few different components. There's the brain, the intracellular and interstitial fluid. So that's the fluid within the cells and the fluid around or bathing the cells. Then we have the intravascular fluids, so that's the blood flowing in and out of the cranium, and the cerebral spinal fluid flowing within the ventricles of the brain and around the meninges. So all of these components that fill the skull are tightly regulated. If one of these components all of a sudden becomes larger, this can change the intracranial pressure. For example, if we all of a sudden had a rapid increase of blood flow and blood volume into 
the cranium, there would be also an increase in intracranial pressure. And the same would go for the opposite. If we had a dramatic decrease in blood flowing into the cranium, then we would have a decrease in the intracranial pressure. Blood flow into the brain is regulated by carbon dioxide levels in the blood. And these are picked up by chemoreceptors in the carotid bodies, leading up in the carotid arteries, and within the brain themselves. Now, when there's too much carbon dioxide in the body, the body becomes slightly acidic, or should I say the blood becomes slightly acidic. The body responds by causing vasodilation in the cerebral arteries, resulting in an increase of blood flow into the brain in an aid to prevent or combat any hypoxia or ischemia to the brain tissue. And when the opposite happens, when the carbon dioxide levels in the blood become too low, this can be brought on by overventilating a patient and causing too much carbon dioxide blow off, or if the patient themselves is hyperventilating, again causing excessive blow off of carbon dioxide. This results in the butt becoming slightly alkaline. When this happens, the body responds by causing cerebral constriction and decreasing the blood flow to the brain. And now we understand what makes up our intracranial pressure and how blood flow is regulated. We're now going to have a little deeper look into the physiology of blood flow and pressures within the cranium. The first concept I'd like to introduce you to is something that's called the cerebral perfusion pressure. Every organ in our body has a particular perfusion pressure. So we need to have an adequate blood pressure and blood flow to that organ in order for perfusion to occur. Now inside the cranium, because we're dealing with other pressures there, there's a little equation to help us understand this. CCP over here stands for our cerebral perfusion pressure. The normal cerebral perfusion pressure is anywhere between 70 and 80 millimeters of mercury. The cerebral perfusion pressure is worked out by having a look at the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. The mean arterial pressure or MAP is known as the mean or the average pressure within the arteries during a cardiac cycle. And for the average adult patient, that mean arterial pressure is anywhere between 85 and 95 millimeters of mercury. This can be worked out on an equation using your systolic and your diastolic measurements. And there also are some electronic case sheets and case, patient care records which work out the mean arterial pressure for you automatically when you insert your systolic and your diastolic blood pressures when taking vital signs. Something that we don't have control over and can't measure in the pre-hospital setting is the intracranial pressure. But we know that the normal values for the intracranial pressure is anywhere between 5 and 15 millimeters of mercury. And anything above that 15 millimeters of mercury is known as raised intracranial pressure. Treatments usually begin when the patient's intracranial pressure is sitting at about 20 millimeters of mercury or more. So in order to get a cerebral perfusion pressure, we take the mean arterial pressure and minus that intracranial pressure. I'm going to give an example of this and how it's affected by changes in blood pressure. Say we've just had a patient who has fallen on the ground, they've hit their head and they're starting to show signs and symptoms of a head injury. This patient's mean arterial pressure is 90 millimeters of mercury, so their blood pressure is still very good. But Slowly but surely, because of swelling that's occurring in their brain, the intracranial pressure has increased up above the normal to about 20 millimeters of mercury. If we minus the ICP from the MAP in this patient, we are left with a cerebral perfusion pressure of 70 millimeters of mercury. 
And this is still within our normal ranges that we have over here. Let's say with the same patient that all of a sudden the blood pressure starts to decrease and now the mean arterial pressure is 70 millimeters of mercury and because of this continuous swelling of the brain and edema that's occurring the intracranial pressure increases to about 24 millimeters of mercury. Now to get our CCP we just take the intracranial pressure and minus it off the mean arterial pressure and we end up with 46 millimeters of mercury. Now if we have a look at this reading compared to what's the normal cerebral perfusion pressure we can see that this is totally inadequate. The brain is not going to be able to be perfused adequately so this will cause hypoxia on the brain and ischemia and tissue death if not reversed. The take-home messages off the slide is really that we need to have an appropriate blood pressure and an appropriate intracranial pressure in order for the brain tissue to be perfused. Any changes in the blood pressure and the intracranial pressure could have really severe effects on the brain in the sense that it would become hypoxic and ischemic. I will tie these concepts into a later stage within the presentation when we start talking about treating patients with raised intracranial pressure and how to recognize the signs and symptoms and manage the condition. Now that we've had a good thorough look at the anatomy and the physiology, we're going to move on to the different types of injuries of the face and the skull.